Excuse me, do you know what goes on in this building? Is there a fire station? It used to be a council building, isn't there? It used to be a fire station. I would go to the, um, the town surveyor and he'll tell you what. The Conservation Centre were working to prolong the life of all the collections held in trust by the National Museums and Galleries on Merseyside. In the sculpture studio, the work varies from cleaning and restoring sculptures of all kinds to making brand new replicas. The spirit of Liverpool was rescued after 120 years on the roof of the Walker Art Gallery and is now in the foyer of the centre. An exact copy is being made to replace it. If you look at the building, the building is not terribly decayed, but the sculpture is. Now it's quite clear, and we know from the records, that the sculpture on the building was a major part of the cost of building that uh, building. Therefore, it was always a vital element. Now if you take off the sculpture and say, OK, it's decayed, we'll just take it away, you're left with something which has lost a lot of its significance. Now, if you put back the sculpture in replica, then you're re-establishing the whole intention of the original building. So, in a sense, that's what we're doing. We're looking at it. If the building itself was like, a, say, a ruined monastery, it would be very different. We'd take a different approach. But here we've got a building that's in pretty good condition, very much as it was intended to be seen and the sculpture has deteriorated far more rapidly than the building. This dinghy is a replica of one built locally in Rock Ferry in 1935. The original was considered too precious to return to the water. The original boat is quite sound. There was some attack at some stage when it was with its original owner. There was some woodworm attack which we basically treated. It hasn't affected the structure, but there is a general view around that wooden boats should really be used in the water all the time, even ones in museums, which I can understand in some people. But our business is to is really to preserve unique or very special craft on the longer term. And if you use it, if you use it on the water, you're in a sense kind of putting it at risk. Wooden boats, I think in particular, have a that's a uniqueness about them in that each one, even if you get the same craftsman to build six of the same type of wooden boat, each will be, each will be different than the other. There will be a difference in simply because of the materials involved, the way they're shaped, put into place. So there is a uniqueness about them. Boat builders, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on which way you look at it, are becoming scarcer. And to some degree, too, the very process of building the boat in its original form and style is helping to preserve the original and it's helping to record the skills involved with it and to keep them going. <laughs> Thank you.
Most conservation work, however, does not require such wholesale changes. We're less inclined to make decisions about doing major interventions and treatments, whereas a few years ago perhaps where there would be um, very little concern about decisions to line or reline pitches. We don't take those sorts of decisions anywhere near so lightly these days. We're much more likely to do nothing and to monitor something than we are actually to intervene. And where we do intervene, we try to make that as minimal as possible. We like to remain with the same materials that the artist used as far as possible. Um, we, we would use pigments and media that are stable and that are light fast. In instances where the artist has used pigments or media that aren't light fast or th that age more quickly than perhaps some others, then we will try to use a similar alternative. Sometimes an ordinary object has special significance. A life jacket from the Titanic, for example. I'm going to do very little with the life jacket. It's going on display in the Maritime Museum. I'm going to surface clean it with a, a vacuum cleaner, but I'm not going to try and clean it further. I think in, in a case like this, the actual soiling on the object's part of its interest. Conservators are deciding how to treat these master drawings from the Weld Blundell collection before they go on exhibition at the Walker Art Gallery. This drawing is a 16th century drawing by Tintoretto and it has various problems. There is a very large missing area in the top left hand corner. There are stains such as here, it's a very large stain with a loss in the paper as well. We would like to interfere with the drawing, as it were, to a very minimal extent. What we have decided to do is to simply tidy up the old repair to make it look aesthetically more acceptable and so that when one views the drawing itself, one eye, one's eye is, is not led up into that corner. This early 17th century drawing by Rubens, which also has a very large repair in the lower left-hand corner. The texture does not quite marry up to the texture of the drawing paper, but it is similar enough for us to be able to tone, tone it down in colour and reduce the texture so that it, it will look much more acceptable. So should we be able to see the actual repair work on objects when they're on display? Conservators sometimes use a simple guideline to help with this. The six foot six inch rule means um, we, we don't specifically get a tape measure out and sort of judge this accurately, but six inches meaning if you get close to an object, you, it's obvious where its repair is. On viewing it from a sort of the distance of a case, the way you would look in um, a showcase or at an object to view it if you were in a gallery, what we're saying is the treatment uh, should not be obvious. This painting of Dante and Beatrice by Henry Holliday was once severely damaged. In fact, the damage was so serious that it changed the way we transport works of art. In 1966, temperature and humidity changes during a flight to Rome caused the canvas to shrink and the paint to peel from the surface. Painstaking work by Italian conservators means that the painting can once again be enjoyed in the Walker Art Gallery. We're now able to send even quite delicate paintings abroad. This German painting by Carl Gusso is on a wooden panel. Timber warps easily when the humidity changes, and in the past it would have been unthinkable to have loaned it out for exhibition. The conservators are installing the painting in a microclimate box, which will keep it in a stable environment and ensure it's fully protected. An indicator sealed in the box allows conditions to be constantly monitored. The Kingston brooch is also being prepared for travel to another museum. It's one of the most celebrated pieces in our collection. It's an Anglo-Saxon brooch dating from the 7th century and the surface 
decoration is made up of lots of gold filigree work and also cut garnets which are inlaid into these gold cells. And there must be getting on for 100 garnets in the brooch. And when I came to check it to see if it was fit to travel, I discovered that a few of them had worked loose in their cells. So before it could go out on loan, it was necessary to consolidate some of the garnets into their cells um, by adding some acrylic resin to hold them in place. Museum objects must be handled carefully on the move, but they may also be under threat when standing still. Vulnerable objects such as furniture on open display have to be carefully monitored. Measures are taken to keep the temperature and humidity stable throughout the gallery to prevent damage like this from occurring. This split in an 18th century English commode will be repaired by the furniture conservators. Light levels can also cause problems. The best solution to preserving textiles is to keep the light levels very low. And although it, it is harder for the visitor to see them, I think if you have the right conditions so that you walk through progressively darker areas, you, your eyes will actually adapt to dark conditions. These are two painted silk embroideries from the Lady Lever Art Gallery. There's a large collection of early English embroidery in the gallery, and a lot of it's in quite bad condition because it's been displayed for a long time in very high light levels. If we kept them on display in bright conditions, they'd be destroyed completely. Sometimes the actual material used can be unstable, as in this 17th century drawing by Guccino. It's in an ink called iron gall ink. It is very acidic by nature, and it can become so acidic that it will deteriorate the paper to such an extent that the paper can break down completely in those areas. Two areas here, this has actually happened, and the paper has dropped away from those areas. The spots are fly droppings, which we very often find on paper. So one of the jobs we have with this drawing is to remove the accretion and to draw out the stain. Statues in our cities are also suffering, but it's pollution from traffic and industry causing the damage. The problem is that pollution, although statistics in a way try to say that it's getting better, uh, most of us who've worked with sculpture outdoors know that in fact things are deteriorating as quickly now as they ever have, and if not, quicker. And our problem is that we have to try and find better techniques for uh, cleaning and treating the sculptures, which is partly why we've developed the laser technology we're using, because we're trying to find more effective ways of cleaning things, but at the same time creating far less damage to those objects whilst we're treating them. Not all treatments are so futuristic. Conservators sometimes make use of more traditional methods. The Japanese swords have almost a mirror finish on, on parts of the blade and, and, and wonderful uh, sort of satin finishes on other parts. The iron corrosion on the blades, in the past advice was going around that you should remove it uh, using a, a pin and actually scrape the iron corrosion off the surface of the blade. We use traditional Japanese techniques for caring for the blades, which employs the use of a very fine abrasive powder that's wiped along the, the blade with mulberry paper. And the blades are then protected with a very fine layer of clove oil. We often want to discover what lies beneath the surface, and modern technology can help with this detective work. John Millet changed his mind many times before settling on this version of his famous painting, Sir Isambras at the Ford, from the Lady Lever Art Gallery. X-rays help tell the story. During these endless changes, um, the actual figure group in the centre doesn't appear to have been altered very much, except for the actual leg of the knight. As the horse got bigger and then smaller, he, Millet actually adjusted the actual length and 
th there is actually an image clearly shown by the X-radiograph X of a foot that ends about here, and we can see um, a, a, a spur at, 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 a at a higher position. The painting changed hands numerous times in the latter half of the 19th century and was finally purchased by a, a Mr. Benson in the late 1880s. In 1892, that's only four years before Millet's death, he actually asked Millet to make yet more changes to the, to the horse, most particular to elaborate upon the strapping here, the bells and leather work of the, of the, of the horse here, and also the crupper and these details at the end. I'm hoping that all the documentation I leave behind in terms of sorting out the order of events that Millet went through will be of great help to the next restorer because it's actually taken a phenomenal amount of time to get that sorted out. In contrast to this research work devoted to just one painting, paper conservators are faced with treating and restoring 200,000 negatives in the Stuart Bale Photographic Collection, acquired in 1986. Edward Stuart Bale wasn't satisfied with the quality of uh, results he was getting, so he decided to found his own company and exacted very high standards from his staff. negative has to be removed from its original storage box, surface cleaned and repaired if necessary. It's then rehoused in acid-free folders inside metal storage cabinets. This work will ensure that a unique photographic record of the City of Liverpool is preserved for the future. Conservation work always involves careful judgment, but when it finally comes to starting work on the object, does the conservator need to take a deep breath? Yes, always take a deep breath. So it's a matter of respect for the object. Well, you do, yes, you do, because you know that it's unique. Once you actually sort of really get up close, you start seeing the brush strokes, you really get to feel the effort and the strain in a sense and, and, and anxiety the artist has put, put into actually conceiving the work and with something like this where Millet struggled and struggled and struggled I mean it is quite extraordinary 